strike and live. Bread we must have. Remain and perish. A company that has so unmercifully cut our wages and finally has reduced us to starvation has lost all sympathy. In the summer of 1877, the Great Railroad Strike erupted spontaneously in West Virginia when workers on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad stopped work. The railroad workers' wages had been repeatedly slashed, and the strike spread quickly all along the line. The merchants and community at large all along the line of the road are on our side, and the working classes of every state in the Union are in our favor. 100,000 railroad workers went out on strike, soon followed by half a million other laborers who supported their cause. Violence erupted as local police and state militias were called to put down the strikes, but many people openly sympathized with the workers, including some of the very men sent to defeat them. Many of us have reason to know what long hours and low pay mean, and any movement that aims at one or the other will have our sympathy and support. We may be militiamen, but we are workmen first. When federal troops were called up, the first great nationwide strike in U.S. history was finally broken. But the power of collective action brought a glimmer of hope to the American working class, grown increasingly desperate under the yoke of corporate capitalism. In the early 19th century, you had independent farmers, you had slavery, you had artisans, you had crafts workers, uh, you had uh, domestic workers, um, you had small business people. By the end of the 19th century, more and more people were swept up into what was called the wages system, a system which people no longer possessed their own tools, no longer possessed their own shop, but now labored for someone else. For the majority of Americans, wage labor was rarely a means of getting ahead. It was a requirement of daily survival. Men, women, and even children worked long hours under hazardous conditions in exchange for as little as a dollar a day. The American working class was extremely heterogeneous, ethnically, racially, uh, and uh, divided by gender as well. It's hard to speak of a working class. What you have is working classes. In the American South, slavery had been ended, but African Americans, although free, by and large, labored on the land owned by whites under extremely harsh and brutal conditions. In the North, you had a developing factory system that was populated by native-born Americans who kind of occupied the upper level of management and or skilled uh, work, uh, and you had newer immigrants filling up through the bottom ranks of unskilled and common labor. Factory operators and the machine tenders in the textile mills in New England and in the sweatshops in New York were by and large teenage girls. You saw not many married women, white women, out working for wages, but an enormous number of teenage immigrant girls and the sons and the daughters of immigrants. Child labor was extremely common in the 19th century. There was an economic logic to bringing children into the workforce, sometimes in textile mills, to work besides parents, performing whatever labor that they could to contribute any way that they could to the family economy. The very diversity of American workers made it difficult to forge a unified response to the conditions that they faced. And with no government protection, there was little to prevent the mistreatment and exploitation of laborers. It was no uncommon thing in these sweatshops for men to sit and bend over a sewing machine continuously from 11 to 15 hours a day in July weather. They dared not stop working knowing that there were plenty of other men ready instantly to take their places. 
Imagine a world in which there are no laws uh, regarding health and safety uh, on the job. Imagine a world in which there's no social security or unemployment benefits if you lose your job. Imagine a world in which there are no laws protecting the rights of labor to organize trade unions without uh, suffering the consequences uh, of persecution by their employers. No minimum wage laws. When wages are cut, there's nothing to fall back on. Working conditions were abysmal and led frequently to illness or injury. Lack of ventilation and safety precautions turned garment factories and sweatshops into fire traps. Industrial accidents were common. I commenced work in a factory where they made oil cans and tea caddies. Most every day it happens that a finger or hand was cut off, but what did it matter? They was paid off and sent home, and others would take their place. Employers viewed their workers, in many cases, not as fellow human beings, uh, but as an army of labor, looking at them in a very utilitarian way. They're there to do the job. If they can't do the job, get out. We'll get someone else to do it. The gap between rich and poor was certainly an economic one, uh, with vast disparities of wealth separating the two groups. But it was also an ideological and social one, in which those at the upper end of society could not comprehend the lives of those at the bottom, uh, much less offer them sympathy or appreciate them uh, as fellow human beings. Nowhere was there, apparently, any relief for this ferocious waste of human life. These people were cast into the turmoil of the let alone civilization of America. No one paid any attention to them or cared what happened to them, with the result that many of them were literally worked to death. The climate for labor in the late 19th century was not a favorable one. For the most part, employers disliked trade unions immensely uh, and viewed them as intrusions on managers' right to organize production as they saw fit. The government didn't recognize the rights of labor to organize, much less strike and shut down production. All of the instruments of government uh, were really connected to corporate wealth. Uh, they were not neutral. The people in the government, whether they're in justices on the Supreme Court or members of Congress, have much, much stronger ties to business than they have to working people. Labor activists were threatened with loss of their jobs and worse. For those who dare take on the dangerous task of organizing workers, inspiration could be found in a radical new theory that had swept Europe. No doctrine whatever made so quick its mark around the world. No doctrine ever made so many converts in so few years. Girls brought up in mansions, youths of rich and aristocratic parents, worked as common factory hands, leading a life of misery only to preach the gospel of the saving of mankind. Socialism, communism, anarchism. In Europe, they had a background of political involvement and political consciousness, uh, which was in many ways new to the American scene. Chicago had a very thriving, radical German community. They provided sort of the core of the militant labor struggles uh, that spread around the country. American socialists in the late 19th and early 20th century argued that there was an inevitable conflict between labor and capital. That capital exploited the working class. In the place of a capitalist system, uh, they proposed a whole variety of, of alternatives, economic cooperatives, uh, in which workers owned their own factories. Uh, others argued that the government, uh, that the state uh, ought to manage and run, to some degree, uh, the American economy. In his autobiography, labor organizer Oscar Niebe recalled the cruel irony of wage slavery in a free market. I returned to New York when I was 14 years old. The bloody war was just over. I saw the sunburned soldiers in their torn garments returning from the south 
where they fought for freedom and liberty and broke down the slavery of the black race to enter the slavery of the white. He was a socialist. He was one of the first Marxists. When Marx's book came out, he decided that that was the right way of life and that it was going to provide a better life for everyone. And I'm sure that when he saw the conditions and the sense of poverty and so forth, he just couldn't stand it. He had to do something about it. From the railroad strike of 1877, labor organizers had learned that the success of future strikes would depend on strong, well-funded unions organized at the national level. Two national unions gained prominence during the decade after the railroad strike, each taking a different approach to the problem of organizing the working classes. The big breakthrough for organized labor came in the 1880s with the noble and holy order of the Knights of Labor. This organization uh, was remarkable in American history. Uh, it became the largest organization of workers that the nation had ever seen. It was open to skilled and unskilled. Where the Knights of Labor was inclusive, welcoming unskilled workers, welcoming workers regardless of race and ethnicity. The American Federation of Labor, the AFL was a federation of craft unions, of trade unions, of skilled men who tended to be white. The doors of most federation unions remain closed to workers of other races and ethnicities. Both the Knights of Labor and the AF of L objected to the long hours demanded of workers and supported the movement for an eight-hour day. We mean to make things over. We're tired of toil for naught. With bare enough to live upon and never an hour for thought. On May 1st, 1886, labor activists called for a general strike in support of the eight-hour day. In Chicago, 45,000 workers marched peacefully down Michigan Avenue. Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Violence began on May 3rd at the McCormick Harvester factory when police fired on striking workers. A meeting was quickly called for the following night in Haymarket Square to protest the police brutality. It was a big crowd, and they had speakers there talking to the crowd. Everybody was there reported that, you know, it was a peaceful meeting. The police arrived, and they ordered the speaker to call the meeting to a halt, uh, which he wouldn't, whereupon the police barged into the crowd. But at that point, a bomb exploded in the midst of the police. The explosion killed seven police officers and wounded many more. The police opened fire on the crowd killing several and wounding at least 200. Over the next few weeks and months, hundreds of workers in Chicago were arrested, suspects beaten, meeting halls and printing offices broken into and searched, labor organizations raided and ransacked. The ensuing repression broke the back of the strikes. The press participated in what we can call a kind of a national red scare. Uh, kind of drumming up fear and hatred. It had some of the same characteristics as later Red Scares in, in, the, in the sense that you did not have to prove individual guilt. In the end, eight leading anarchists were selected for trial, including Albert Parsons and Oscar Niebe. These men had been selected, picked out by the grand jury and indicted because they were leaders. They are no more guilty than the thousands who follow them. Gentlemen of the jury, convict these men, make examples of them, hang them, and you save our institutions, our society. Parsons, who was kind of the head of this group of socialists, of these workers, uh, was a block away when the bombing occurred. 
my grandfather was home. The rest of them were all away. They were convicted, they were sentenced to death, and it became a national issue and even an international issue. The Haymarket Affair turned many people against organized labor and convinced others that its future was doomed. But for some, it had the opposite effect. The bloodlust of the press turned their stomachs, while the blatant partiality of the court caused it to be seen as a travesty of justice. Four of the eight were actually uh, executed. One other, Louis Ling, blew himself up in his cell, and three others were eventually released, pardoned by Governor Altgeld. On June 26, 1893, Six years after the Haymarket bombing, Oscar Nevy and the two remaining defendants were released. In the words of the governor of Illinois, the defendants were not proven to be guilty of the crime. When Oscar was released from prison, it, it was tough on grandfather. And the papers would call him, you know, as an anarchist. My grandfather, his family, my father's family all experienced rejection, living in a public, living in a world where they were looked down upon because they had done this heinous thing, even though he was innocent and hadn't done anything. Because of that, and living under those kinds of circumstances, my dad just never mentioned it. He didn't want me to have to go through the same experience he went through. The impact was emotional, the impact was psychological, and he did not want me to have to go through that. The 1890s brought two major clashes between capitalists and workers the Homestead Strike and the Pullman Strike. On their outcome hinged the lives of thousands of individual workers and the future of organized labor. We see in the 1890s a series of labor wars where basically managers join together and owners join together to try to suppress the development of unions. And we can see this, I think, most dramatically in the Homestead Lockout. They went up against Andrew Carnegie, one of the most powerful industrialists in America, and Henry Clay Frick, his manager. And Carnegie had dealt with the union in the past. He now came to the conclusion that more money could be made, his hands could be freer if he was free of dealing with the union, and resolved that he would no longer deal with the Amalgamated Association. If that were the case, Organized workers thought there would be no stopping him in changing conditions, cutting wages, increasing the working day, you name it. Uh, so this was a very important battle to define what rights would organized labor have, what skilled workers have uh, in American society. The owners were very successful in mustering the state, generally the governor and the local state militia, to come in to prevent, quote, violence and to save private property. So that at Homestead, for example, the workers are very surprised when the National Guard comes in and in its role of protecting Mr. Carnegie's factory, helps protect strike breakers who come in and take their job. Two years after Homestead, another group of workers made their case to corporate management and to the public at large. The company town of Pullman, Illinois, had started out to be a worker's paradise, but it ended up more like a prison. Pullman cars were manufactured in a little town, Pullman, Illinois, which was actually a company town, so that the employer not only controlled their work lives, the employer was also their landlord. The employer also chose the schools that their kids went to, the ministers uh, of their churches, the police who patrol the streets. We're born in the Pullman house, fed from the Pullman shop, taught in the Pullman school, catechized in the Pullman church, and when we die, we shall be buried in the Pullman cemetery and go to the Pullman hell. 
Coleman prided himself on taking care of his workers. But in the wake of the Depression of 1893, he slashed their pay five times without ever lowering their rent. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. We could not stand it any longer. I, like a good many others, had to stop carrying my dinner, as what I had to carry would have run through the basket. Their wages cut below subsistence level, their jobs threatened by cutbacks, and the company in control of every facet of their existence, the workers appealed to the American Railway Union, an industrial union that included both skilled and unskilled railroad workers. The uh, American Railway Union uh, decided that they would support the Pullman workers by calling basically an, a national strike of the railroads all throughout the East. And that strike was probably one of the most dramatic uh, events in, in American labor history. And Eugene Debs emerged as an important figure in the course of that strike. Boycott was declared uh, on all Pullman cars. And a Pullman car was attached to a railroad. Workers for the American Railway Union uh, enrolled in that organization would not work on that train. This is a mighty test between labor and capital, and we will fight it to the finish. The Pullman strike stretched from New York to the West Coast. It went to the heart of the struggle between owners' rights and workers' rights, and the owners weren't about to lose. The General Managers Association, an association of railway employers, called upon the federal government. The courts got involved, issued injunctions. They put railway mail cars uh, on trains so that refusing to carry uh, these cars or to deal with them in any way meant that you were interfering with the mails, a federal offense. In the end, the strikers were defeated not by soldiers but by lawyers with weapons that were far more effective than guns. Federal District Court judges in Chicago issued a sweeping injunction that made it a crime to interfere, hinder, obstruct, or stop the business of the railroads in any way. The arrest of Eugene Debs and the defeat of the Pullman strike brought about the rapid disintegration of the American Railway Union, and with it many workers' hopes for the success of industrial unionism. For Eugene Debs, the Pullman strike was a watershed. The issue is socialism versus capitalism. I am for socialism because I am for humanity. We have been cursed with the reign of gold long enough. Eugene Debs arrived at the conclusion that a system organized around the pursuit of profit and not moral worth uh, was morally inadequate uh, was a system that deserved to be changed uh, and in its place uh, he advocated uh, a socialist alternative where human worth he believed would be recognized uh, and that everything would not be reduced to the pursuit of profit 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 uh, at the cost of human life and human dignity while there is a lower class i am in it while there is a criminal element, I am of it. Where there is a soul in prison, I am not free. I'm introduced at 15 years of age to my aunts and uncles. Uh, they, in turn, made a deal with the family that my brother, uh, Jim, and I should go down to Mexico City and spend the summer vacation with them. But on May 1st, my uncle came to me and said, let's go into the city and, and see the parade in honor of your grandfather. He said, I don't know what it is you're talking about. And then he began to tell me that grandfather was one of the martyrs of the Haymarket, how the French had declared May Day as a public holiday, Labor Day, for the world, how the world was now all celebrating 
Labor Day on the 1st of May in honor of what they call the Martyrs of the Haymarket. In the United States, however, the Martyrs of Haymarket were mostly forgotten. The struggles of workers to organize against big business had been put down. For the time being, labor would retreat, presenting no serious challenge to the power of capitalists. There were very few gains for organized labor in terms of gaining the right to bargain collectively. That won't really happen until the Wagner Act in the 1930s. And part of the reason has to do with the middle class. Whenever there is a strike, once the troops came in, there was massive violence, and the middle class were horrified. And instead of siding with the workers, they immediately sided with the owners and with the National Guard who came in to suppress the strike. Many of the strikes of the late 19th century ended in violence and ended in failure, in part because so much was at stake. For employers, what was at stake was their right to manage. Any infringement upon that right wasn't a minor issue, but was a core challenge to their power, their authority, their sense of themselves. For American workers, what was at stake was certainly wages, working conditions, and hours of labor, all of which were tremendously important. It matters whether one could bring home uh, enough money to feed one's family. It mattered whether one worked 12 hours a day or eight hours a day. And it mattered in workers' eyes that they had a voice in the way that the American economic system, even at the small level of the workplace, was managed. It was about conditions and wages, yes, but it was also about dignity.